Hello, good evening to everyone. Good evening to everyone. I am Mildred DJ Parr, that's the Hoya Parr. And I will be lecturing about the different forms of poetry. Okay. So, before anything else, let me share a little bit about myself. I'm also a teacher. I'm teaching now senior high school. And... Okay, I'm teaching senior high school and I'm teaching mostly literature subjects, uh, also creative writing and English for academic and professional purposes. So I've been teaching literature for quite a number of years and mostly in literature I'm talking or dealing with poetry. Now to describe literature, To describe literature, literature is a, uh, a is an expression of significant human experiences that are told in words um, that are highly chosen and uh, using figurative language, and uh, that's to evoke imagination from the readers. So that's literature for you. And poetry is actually one part of literature. It's a genre of literature. And uh, it's characterized by its brevity. Oh, thank you. There is one. <laughs> it's characterized by its brevity or being brief. So it's characterized by lines, by stanza, by rhythm, rhyme. But nowadays, sometimes we have a free verse. So we cannot just say that poet is all about rhyme and rhythm and meter and all. So we can also have what you call the free verse. So I'm here to talk about poetry. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I just wasn't able to read your name and thank you. So, okay. Yes, so I'll be talking about the different forms of poetry, but before that, we must understand first all about the rhymes and the stanza because it is the um, it's the brick, bricks that lays the foundation. Thank you, Dr. Pasana Kumar. Thank you very much. So, uh, when we have the lines okay when we have the lines that comprises the stanza actually the stanza is stanza is like a train of thought so you have there the number of lines that comprises a stanza now when you have one liner uh, so it's just a one liner uh, poetry but if you have two then you call that a couplet when you say couplet there are two kinds of couplet, by the way, the ha the heroic couplet and the regular couplet. Uh, the regular couplet is just uh, separated, or it's an, uh, uh, what do you call this? It's a uh, separate kind of couplet. But when you say heroic couplet, it's a couplet that is part of a larger poetry, like in the case of a sonnet. So that's a heroic couplet for you. Okay, so couplet is composed of two lines in a stanza. Now, three lines we have what we call tercet. We have four lines. We called it we called it quatrain. For five lines, we call it sinquain. In other uh, in other things, it's called a uh, quintet or quintilios, like in the court in the case of passion. Uh, we also have six line is a sestet, seven line is called a septet, eight lines octet, but there's no nine lines anymore. It's uh, the nine line of a poem or a sonnet is what you call volta. Okay, so that's the ninth line of a sonnet. It's a turning point of a sonnet. It's called a volta. 
Okay, so what about rhymes? Rhymes are, these are the final words. So these are same final words. Sometimes it's between. It's an internal rhyme when it's in between a uh, line of poetry. For example, like, Jim knocks, Jim knocks. Have you knock? So something like that. So it's a internal rhyme. We also have what we call a slant rhyme or near rhyme. And they are almost the same, but they have a very different sound at the end. So we also have a feminine rhyme and a masculine rhyme. So, But that's another talk. What we are focused on is the kind of poetry. Although we're sliding a little bit on those because this is the, the, the brick that lays on the foundation what else so we have also what we call the meter or the foot the foot is actually a combination of unstressed and stressed sound like an iamb iamb is called in is a normal way of speaking of things like i am is a unstressed and stressed i am so you have iambic meter there. And then we have what we call the trochee is a stress and unstressed, like trochee. And then we have another one, which is a sponde or spondaic. We have the, uh, the both are stressed. And then we have what we call the uh, anapestic. Like when we say anapestic, you have the two unstressed and one stressed. And then we also have the dactylic. Dactylic is stressed and two unstressed syllables. So those are the metrical patterns. So again, let's go back to the topic now since there are already uh, viewers. So we'll go back to the forms of poetry or what we call the kinds of poetry. However, I cannot discuss or exhaust all the kinds of poetry because there are too many. What I intend to discuss are the mainstream ones, the, the common ones, the most common ones. So in having the different kinds of poet poetry, it is now divided into three main, ty main types. The first one is the lyric, the second one is the narrative, and the third one, we call it dramatic. For the lyric poetry, it is characterized by its being short because uh, lyric poetry has been accompanied with musical accompaniment and is just for entertainment. So it's just short. For example of this is uh, what you call haiku, the elegy, the ode, and the sonnet. Those are lyric poetry. On the other hand, we have what we call the narrative. It's called the narrative because it is narrating a story or telling a story. Hi, Amelia. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, narrative poetry narrates or tell a story. And we have what we call those two kinds, which are the epic and the ballad. Later, I will tell you a ballad. I will show how it is done. Harmiet. Hello, <laughs> thank you for uh, watching. And then uh, we also have what we call the last one among the kind. We have the dramatic. No, wait. <laughs> no, this dramatic poetry, these are being staged like they are being performed on stage and quite long. Okay, so. Let's go back to those which are the lyric poetry. So we start with let's start with a haiku. Okay. So haiku has been characterized with a kigo. What is a kigo? A kigo is a seasonal element. So in the Philippines, we don't have here many seasons, but we only have the dry and the, the rainy season. So we have only dry and wet seasons. But in other country, there are four seasons, which are the spring, summer, fall, and winter. Winter, spring, summer, and fall. So they have their own characteristics. 
for example when you have the colorful leaves then that's the autumn and then you have there the heat of the sun characterizes the summer and so forth and so on so in a haiku there's always a seasonal element called the kigo next we have there a contrasting element for example we have their images when we say images yes uh, Hermit, we love to write the haiku uh, for the images we can have the audio or the one that we listen to or the visual that we see or gustatory that we taste or olfactory that we smell and of course the touch which is tactile and then the movement which is kinesthetic so we have how many images we have six images again the visuals that we see the auditory that we hear the olfactory that we smell the gustatory that we taste and the touch which is tactile so there is a contrasting element for example the one that you see and then on the second part it's the one that you hear or sometimes there are contrasting elements like near or far general and specific hi reshma <laughs> so you have some contrasting elements there and then of course the last one which is the really the characteristic of a haiku is it is composed of five seven five syllables and that is of course when you do syllabus is the smallest unit of sound produced when uttering a word for example in the word syllables we have syllables we have three syllables there okay so that was haiku for you and then let me tell you a bit about the haiku a bit about background of the haiku usually before when there are some uh, in the in Japan where it was originated there were two lovers uh, which are actually courting each other for example a man a man is going to issue two lines and the woman will respond with the last line so that's how it goes and then there's somebody or a woman would respond with two lines and then the, the man will respond with the last line so that's how it goes and uh, as the time goes on, it becomes a continuing uh, haiku. So it's an alternating, it's a choka, and then continuing it, be, it becomes a renga. And then soon it becomes like so long, it has been quite a long alternating kind of uh, exchanging of words, exchanging of syllables and lines. So five, seven, five, and then again, five, seven, five, so what happened is that it becomes so long. So in the end, they return back to the three line. They cut the long <laughs> continuation of a haiku and make it hoku. So that is hoku, H-O-K-K-U. So from, ho from haiku, uh, from hoku or haiku to choka to renga to tanka. Tanka is five lines. Okay, so you have there haiku, choka, renga, tanka. Tanka is five, seven, five, seven, seven syllables. And then it became, it, go back, it goes back to haiku or hoku, which, which is composed of three lines. Next, I've mentioned a while ago about the tanka, so I might as well discuss about the tanka. By the way, we, all, we are discussing all about the lyric poetry, which are the very short poem. Where is it? Anyway, I'll have the other one, which is a sin point. Sin point. Maybe you are familiar with the sin point. Uh, it is composed of five lines, five lines, which has 22 syllables, which is composed of two, four, six, eight, and go back to two syllables. So we're counting syllables and it amounted up to 22. So you have two, four, six, eight, and two. I'll give you an example. 
it's not arranged. But, uh, you know, it's more of counting syllables because Japanese characters are of syllabic nature. Unlike with us, we have words, but for them, uh, they have syllabic. Okay, here it is. So this is an example of a sin queen. How frail above, how frail, that's two, above, above the bulk of, of crashing water hangs, um, autumn now, evanescent, one, and then moon. And then this is a sin coin. So you have there 22 syllables. 2, 4, 6, 8, and 2. But we have another example of a sin coin. Uh, another example of a sin coin is simply one word title and then two words to describe the title. And then you have there. Okay, here it is. So another form of haiku. We have one title, one word title, then two words, and then you have the, describe the uh, title, action words, and verbs, and so you have there, uh, I haven't ex got an example on this, so title, two words, describe the title, and action verb, and two words, four, so it basically is one, two, and then four, and then it goes back to the synonym of a title. So that's the sin coin. There are two kinds of sin coin. Now this one is also can be under lyric because it's also short. Okay, we have what we call the sino, which was designed by our very own the Indian writer, Mr. Kamral Pokrel. So. Sino is a micro poem, which means it's a very short poem of three lines having seven, eight, and nine syllables. So seven syllables, eight syllables, and nine syllables. And it has a rhyme scheme or the pattern of rhymes, which is composed of A, 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 B, A, B, A, A, B, B, or it could be a free verse. Okay, so that's the Sino for you. And also, under lyric, we have what we call the uh -huh. elegy. For the elegy, it is a poem of serious reflection, which is all about grief or lamentation. Okay, thank you. Faisal, Justin, thank you. Lavab, Dorji, and Sai, thank you very much. So... An um, elegy is all about grief and lamentation, and therefore uh, very lonely, very lonesome. Next, we have under lyric, we have ode. Sorry for my handwriting. <laughs> uh, it just was written, it was not uh, printed anyway. I don't have a printer. So, ode is actually a lyric poem which is meant to. Uh, dignify or to exalt, meaning to give praise, like ode and aggression earn, and then uh, some more odes. And then, of course, we have the sonnet. Actually, you know, the story of a sonnet is uh, it is called sonetto, sonetto from Italian word as uh, little songs. Uh, this is actually. Francesco Petrarch, who was the one who created this. By the way, Francesco Petrarch has a lover, which is Laura, and she used to give her some little songs until he finally created a poetic form, which is called the uh, sonetto there. Uh, the sonetto is composed of 14 lines, always of 14 lines, but uh, when it was uh, held by William Shakespeare and he used the, Shakespeare, the sonnet, it becomes also 14 lines but it has a different rhyme scheme. 
So what is a rhyme scheme? A rhyme scheme is actually a, 14, uh, a pattern of rhymes there. In Italian, it has a sestet and an octave. When you say sestet, uh, it's actually six lines. An octave, a... Oh, it's octave first and then sestet. When you say octave, it's composed of eight lines and sestet, six lines. So the format is the eight lines, which is the octave, presents a problem or a, spe a specific situation. And uh, the, eight the six lines, which is the sestet, actually provides the solution. So if it is a problem, then a solution by the sestet. If it is a question, then an answer on the six lines is dead. Meanwhile, when Shakespeare brought it to England, uh, it has a different shape. It becomes the quatrains. So quatrains, I told you a while ago, is composed of four lines. So we have quatrain one, second quatrain, third quatrain, and then... So we have first quatrain is four, second quatrain is another four, and the third quatrain is another four. Therefore, you have there 12 lines. And then the last two lines, what you call a heroic couplet. I mentioned a while ago that heroic couplet is different from other couplets. Why? Because in a couplet, couplet can stand alone, like in epigrams, like in riddles, it can stand alone. But heroic couplet is a connected couplet to other bigger poems like the sonnet. Okay, so we have one quatrain, which is composed of A, B, A, B rhyme scheme, and another one, which is uh, C, D, C, D, and then another one, which is E, F, E, F, and finally, the heroic couplet is G, G. So you have their A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and G, G. Meanwhile, going back to Italian, uh, Italian sonnet, we have what we call the uh, octave, which is composed of the... A, B, A, A, B, C, D, E, F. So it's a different rhyme scheme. And then the sestet is C, D, C, D, C, D, C, D, C, D. Okay, so it's A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, and then C, D, C, D, C, D. Okay, so that's, whole, that's a whole lot of... Uh, and another one, by the way, also when you talk about the metrical pattern, it's called iambic pentameter. I told you a while ago, iambic is composed of uh, stre and stress and stress, like I am, I am, whose woods, whose woods. So you have their iambic and you have their pentameter. So uh, let's say uh, sonnet 18, um, shall I compare the two a summer's day, thou art more temperate. So you can say that the musicality or the meter or the rhythm. Rhythm is the flow of sound. So I just say the flow of sounds in sonnet is more, how do you call this, more patterned, more regular. And then um, let us not in the marriage of true minds admit impediments love is not love something like that so it has a flow of sounds a rhythm and then of course we have also another one so spencerian it's another kind of sonnet a different design and my favorite writer elizabeth barrett browning in her uh escapade elopement with the husband we have what we call the um, what again? How do I love thee? I memorize it by heart because even when I was in elementary, I used to recite it. So it's like, um, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight, out of the ideal, an ideal grace. Okay, I will not continue anymore, but I love the poem. It was by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the, the wife of uh, Robert Browning. You know the two, the younger Browning, the Robert is younger, but 
uh, Elizabeth is frail, so the father did not did not agree on the union between the two, and so they have a loop. And to uh, to this guy is their elopement. They said it's son is from the Portuguese. When in fact they did not go around. Anyway, that was two. We have a lot to discuss. Next, we have what we called. Again, excuse my handwriting. For the ballad, uh, the ballad is actually a what you call it a lyric. I uh, know it's. Sorry, it's a narrative. Now I'm on the narrative. So lyric poetry includes, what does it include? It includes Sinquain, Haiku, Tanka, the Sonnet, and the Ode and the Elegy. Those are the lyric poems. We move now on to the narrative. When we say narrative, it narrates a story or it tells a story. And we have... Okay, the ballads are, the ballads are, these are the poems that has a story to tell. It is characterized by a dialogue. So it has an answer. Usually two characters uh, under ballad, but only one singer, although there seems to be a dialogue. And it has a singable quality and repetitive refrains. What are refrains? These are lines that are repeated all throughout. Uh, it's like a a repeated line let me tell you one one ballad this is uh my favorite ballad and i used to sing it it's lord randall let me tell you the story of lord randall for a while uh, lord randall was actually a son by a mother and the mother was quite asking questions about lord randall where have you been lord randall my son or where have you been my handsome young man I've been to the wildwood, mother, make my bed soon, for I'm wearied with hunting and fain would lie down. So what's like where it ends so uh, tired? Where have you your bloodhound, Lord Randall, my son? Where have you your bloodhound, my handsome young man? What happens to your dog? Where is your dog? Because he usually goes out with a dog. Oh, the dog swelled, mother, make my bed soon. For I'm wearied with hunting and fain would lie down. What got you for dinner, Lord Randall, my son? What got you for dinner, my handsome young man? The mother is asking, very inquisitive about, what has he for dinner? Because he's not going to be so, so weak like that, if not for... And so Lord Randall admitted, he got eels boiled in broth, mother, make my bed soon. For I'm wearied with hunting and fain would lie down. And then the mother continued to ask, What happened to your bloodhound, Lord Randall, my son? What happened to your bloodhound, my handsome young man? Oh, it swelled and they died, mother. Make my bed soon. What happened to the bloodhound again? It swelled and it died. Why? Because it has ill for, uh, for dinner. And so the mother suspected, Oh, I fear you are poisoned, Lord Randall, my son. I fear you are poisoned, my handsome young man. Oh, yes, dear mother, make my bed soon. For I'm wearied with hunting and fain would lie down. Actually, the mother is very inquisitive because Lord Randall is about to meet with a sweetheart. And the mother is against the sweetheart. So the mother is uh, a little bit uh, suspicious that the sweetheart gave Lord Randall some poison. But actually the real story behind it is uh, the sweetheart breaks the heart of Lord Randall. And breaking the heart make him like he was poisoned, like, you know, he died in the end. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of ballads that are of singable quality. And like in Filipino, we have a ballad of a mother's heart, which tells the story of a certain young man wooing a woman. And there was this mother. And the woman did not like the man. So he said, if you can give me your mother's heart, then I'll respond to you. I'll you know, probably give you a chance. But then because uh, the woman did not like actually the man, but then the man said to the mother, mother she can only love me if i'm going to give your heart to her so the mother said okay go ahead give my heart 
to your sweetheart. So the young man gave the, the sweetheart uh, the mother's heart. And it turned out the woman said, if you give me your mother's heart, how would you love me? How can you love me if you love your mother and you gave your mother's heart to me? How much more uh, would you be loyal to me? Something like that. So the man was dumbfounded and he lost and he was so broken hearted that he felt the mother's heart and still the mother's heart is still caring for the man saying, go get up my son. Okay, so uh, there's a lot of story behind those ballads. Then we move on to another narrative poem. <laughs> Sorry. So, Epic is another narrative poem because it tells a very long story. In fact, it's a kind of story that is long and it has a story within a story like in the story of the Mahabharata. I'm sure you are familiar with Mahabharata, I guess. Hmm? So, Mahabharata is actually a, what do you call this, a faction between two relatives. I'm not so, sorry, Indian. <laughs> I'm not so into it, but then what I know is there are these uh, two sets of brothers and cousins that are fighting over. And then under this Mahabharata, it's long epic, is a story of Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita. I was corrected there by a young man, you know. I had this young friend, young Indian friend, and he corrected me. Oh, you do not pronounce it like that. And uh, I said, oh, how was it pronounced? Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, Indians, if I was not able to pronounce it correctly. Then you also have there the Rama and Sita, the Ramayana. Oh, this is a story of an ideal woman. Okay, if you're familiar with this, these are the stories that are very heart-touching. The story of Rama and Sita, and Sita being abducted and all, remaining to be pristine uh, of a wife, remaining loyal to Rama. But it started with the uh, mothers of the, the, the mothers, oh, and uh, some brothers. So the, the eldest is supposed to be the blessed one, but uh, Kaikeyi or the other woman had made into a point that uh, he, her son will be the one to be blessed. So Rama, who happened to be the first son, was uh, thrown into the woods. Okay, I will not go long in there because <laughs> you know it more than me. And there are many others like Krishna and uh, the others in Bhagavad Gita and also there's a lot like in um, so there's a lot like also what do you call this uh, but in Indian we also have around Panchatantra and Upanishads and there are many more and another which uh, I was reminded of is Shakuntala if you're familiar with Shakuntala I should not be telling this because uh, you are the ones, or mostly the, our viewers are Indians and they know more than me, but all I know about Chakuntala is about the lost train. It has the subtitle in English, which is the lost train. So there is this uh, situation of uh, the love between the king and Chakuntala, but... Uh, they were fated, they were like cursed, that whenever she lost the ring, then the memory of the king will be lost on her. And so in the end, um, because it was taken by the fish, and he was, it so happened that in the end, they were able to uh, revive it, and they were able to reunite. And then the, 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 the son and the daughter were already... Uh, already old and uh, Shakuntala or the king was able to try to test Shakuntala and you know this is very good of the Indian women they are portrayed as a very uh, what do you call this submissive wife and a very 
dutiful wives and in the end they were begin, being given blessings by their husbands after having gone through those tests anyway so we have epic I don't have any examples for the dramatic poetry because it is quite long usually it is uh, dependent on the social issues whatever the social issues Thank you, Hanuka, Faisal, okay, thank you. Oh, Miss Nandenoyer, thank you. I'm so honored having you here. Okay, so so these are some narratives, but in dramatic, as I said, it's usually being performed. By the way, there's a difference between drama and theater, okay? I want you to understand that drama is the written piece, like the literature, and the theater is the one which has a, an area for a performance. And then a play, a play could be uh, anywhere, in a church or in street. So again, there are three words there that are being, mis you know, being interchanged. The drama, the play, and uh, drama is being written by a playwright. And then you have there the, um, theater which is the building or the place where it is being performed and a play which is being performed anywhere okay so that's for the dramatic again we have three major divisions lyric which is all about a short uh, short poetry we have also the uh, what do you see one narrative which narrates a story which tells a story a uh, shorter story is a ballad, singable quality, and uh, a dialogue, which is a refrain. And we have also the uh, epic, which is all about heroes and long battles. Also, like the ones in uh, the ones in uh, Greek, the Greek drama. If you have read the Greek drama, it runs through around. Nine, it started with the ninth year of the war between the Greeks and the Trojans. So I want to discuss it, but if I'm going to discuss it, we're not going to finish anyway. So, but then it's all about Achilles, the mortal, and it's all about the, the gods, the titans, or the gods, the Olympian gods and the titans. So Olympians versus the titans, and then there came the mortals. And the mortals actually the the story started <laughs> i cannot help myself but i want to tell the story uh, the story started with uh achilles <laughs> anyway uh, it's a in media stress or it begins in the middle of things so uh, actually achilles was the one uh, mortal but he became immortal when the mother Thetis hold her or hold him by the ankle or the the heels and he submerged into the river Styx so thereby he become partly immortal because the father wouldn't want him to be burned because the mother Tethys know how to be immortal how to immortalize so she burns him through the fire but uh, the the king when the king found out she he separated the mother from the son in the end uh Thetis also tried to immortalize his son, her son by submerging into the river Styx, okay? And in the end, uh, he was almost immortal except for the heel. So when somebody is very good, but he had a weakness, we call it Achilles heels. Okay, so let me discuss a few more. These are some um, quite, uh, and what do you call this? Poetry, which is... Uh, and not not put into category, okay? But there are, I told you there are a lot more, but these are some of the few of them. We are familiar with this, ABC or Abyssidarian poetry. So ABC poetry is like an acrostic, but it has the A, B, C, D, E. Or it could be words put together. A uh, boy, come, down, so A, B, C, D. 
up to letter Z. So when we say abecedarian, always remember uh, when we say abecedarian, it, co it is composed of the 26 letters of the alphabet. A, B, C poems can be A, B, C, D up to E. Or it could be A to Z, but abecedarian would always finish with the 26th letter of the alphabet. Okay, so that's again ABC or Abyssidarian poetry for you. Next, this is quite familiar with us. Acrostics. When you say acrostics, these are the first letter of each line that spells a word. Like in this case, they are like, for example, when you say free, something like F, R, E, and E. I have done a poem about this for Teacher's Day. So you have there, for example, a Teacher's Day. So T, blah, 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 E, blah, 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 A, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Yes, I like so much to discuss Greek mythology and epic because I knew it so much. I studied it so much. It was so much in my heart. You know, all the intrigues I know. I know all the intrigues about the love intrigues of zoos <laughs> and also uh all this like the the all this uh what do you call transformation myth because they have a lot of transformation myth and we have the layers the constellation of the gods the the main gods <laughs> we have Gaia and uh, the other <laughs> I forgot Uranus or anyway and then we have Rhea and the the partner of you know the partnering of the gods and resulting to demigods and then lower gods hmm, it's so nice I really missed it because they tried to remove it from the curriculum but it's so nice I hope we can talk about, about Greek mythology someday, you know, I really, really love it. And I'll tell you a lot of secrets behind it. Actually, there were two writers there. Uh, the other one was actually Homer. And the other one was another one. So the, the original there is all about the, uh, I guess, the, mm, the story about the um, Helen of Troy. But then later on, they try to go back to the uh, uh, original, which is the constellation of the gods. And then soon they added some stories, become so wide constellation of stories on Greek. They're very, they're very interesting. Mm -hmm. And all the transformation, I really love them. Anyway. Okay, I love this also concrete poetry because when you say concrete poetry, it takes the shape of whatever you are talking about. For example, you're talking about uh, cars and talking about the beetle. It looks like a beetle, you know, the Volkswagen there. Yes, Egyptian mythology. I love Isis and Osiris. I really love... Isis and Osiris, how Isis was able to get the honor for Horus, when in fact, you know, I love them so much. It's just that we don't have time for them. Uh, also, also the, uh, what do you call this? The, the American, the Northern, the Belfrost, what do you call this? The... The giants, the nine worlds, imagine the nine worlds of mythology in Vikings, what do you mean, what do you call it, I forgot, the Vikings there, and <laughs> I'm down to the last one, actually it's already been discussed, yes, so amazing, this mythology, all of them actually, uh, also the the other one, which is all about the African mythology, they also have. And this Quetzalcoatl, the Aztec mythology there. Aztec mythology also, because they have Quetzalcoatl and the discovery of the maize, uh, the corn, and 
also the the sons the five sons of aztec mythology so the five sons actually in when i discussed it with my students they said oh ma because the last will be for the sulfuric because what happened is that you have a son and then if it is it will be uh dismantled then there will be remaining a few creatures to start another sun so after destroying the the, the earth there will be another earth and there will be another sun and there will be another uh another way to this to destroy it so we are on the fifth sun at this time and my student by that time we had a very much earthquake and then my student was like saying mom are we going to end because <laughs> it was foretold in the story okay it was foretold that there will be uh the ending will be all about the earthquake and uh sulfuric uh you know the volcanoes anyway so the last one i guess I have a lot, you know, I have a lot to share, but I guess uh, time would not permit and I cannot show you examples. So maybe if I have a second part on this, then I will do justice to the time being given to me. So, <laughs> the tanka. The tanka is a form of wonka or Japanese song. So, if uh, the sonnet is called sonetto or little songs by the lover uh, francesco petrarch here we have the waka or the japanese song which is actually the short song which is actually born of a haiku i told you before it's a love song between a boy and a, a boy and a girl two lines and then the girl will respond with last line and then again will be responded to so it becomes choka renga and it becomes so long alternating and the long ending sort of poetry they cut it to economize into three lines becoming the hoku or the haiku now here we have the form five seven five seven seven syllables which is actually a continuation of the the, the haiku and then the 77 we call it the envoy what is an envoy an envoy is actually a summation it's a summary okay summary of the work so you have 575 and then the final one is a 77 syllables so i guess because we are poets we know them maybe you know it more than me it's just that uh, I was tasked to discuss with you all about the forms of poetry. I hope I give justice to your time watching. And I do hope that next time I'll give you some bizarre or some more uh, new. Because we, we have what we call formulaic poetry. When we say formulaic poetry, it's a formula. There's a formula for writing a certain poetry. Like... Like when you say uh, there is a A, B, A, B. So you have, ah, yes. We also have the Rhyme Royale and uh, Terza Rima. So we have different, uh, you know. And also we have what we call the Villanelle, the Vignette. <laughs> There's a lot actually. So I cannot really satisfy everything for just a few hours, but I hope. I have entertained you in a way, in a certain way, and I hope you learned something. Although I learn, I know most of you are more knowledgeable than me because we are all teachers here. So I just hope uh, I have given something in addition to what you know. Thank you very much for the time being given to me, and thank you, Chaucer Square, for giving me an opportunity to uh, what do you call this? Share what I know, what little I know. Thank you very much uh, for those who attended. Hira, now was Miss Emilia. Thank you very much. I, you know, uh, you've been so patient with me, and also Sir Alan because i used to have a problem with life so but uh, i hope i get justice and indira the journey thank you very much i have to end now and again i've discussed three kinds of poetry lyric narrative and dramatic okay thank you bye
Oh, please, Nandin Neuer. Thank you very much for watching. I love you very much. Okay, bye to everyone. Bye. I have to end this now.